Yeah, the next talk will be uh, given by Giles Roditi and from the uh, University of Glasgow. The title is uh, History of Future Directions of CEMRA. Good morning, and thank you to Shi Hai for inviting me to speak. Uh, I don't have long, and I first wanted to find out how to advance the slide. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, future and direct history and future directions of contrast enhanced MRA, not just peripheral, but MRA everything I've got to talk about. Um, these are my disclosures, which include that I'm a past past president of this society, and uh, I have some contact with uh, contrast media companies. I'm going to talk about the history, uh, the challenges for contrast enhanced MRA and its current status, and then a little bit about the future of contrast enhanced MRA. I'm going to go over the early years and the basic principles, how hardware and software have impacted contrast enhanced MRA over the years and talk a little bit about contrast agents. So the first contrast enhanced MRI, this is not angiography of course, but this is 1983 in London. The first contrast enhanced MRA was in Leeds in the UK in 1991. This was published in The Lancet. This is uh, Mohan and John Ridgway from Leeds University. But it was two dimensional. The first 3D contrast enhanced MRA paper that we really kind of refer to is this paper from Martin Prince from New York, uh, so 1994. So contrast enhanced MRA has been around for at least 20 years uh, and it's been evolving all over that time. But obviously 3D was a kind of breakthrough in that we weren't just looking at a projection, we could look at a projection in any angle so we could look at things from the side and the front and all the rest of it. But over the years the basic principles of contrast enhanced MRA have not changed. We administer gadolinium contrast agents IV, or a contrast agent IV. We wait until the contrast arrives where we want to see it, and we start the scan with predetermined parameters, and we end up with lovely images. So for me, personally, contrast-enhanced MRA was a real breakthrough in when we first got a scanner that could do this in 1998. Because until this time, then we couldn't image this patient in any other way than by doing a translumbar autogram which involved putting a, a large needle uh, into the patients from the back, um, spearing them from behind, and injecting contrast above the occlusion in order to show the surgeon where they might be able to plumb in their, their, their grafts. Okay? We didn't have CT angiography at this time. There was no competitor to contrast-enhanced MRA, and it was really a revolutionary technology. But we soon we wanted more. We wanted to see not just one station, but we wanted to see what was going on below that station. So this was our first attempt at sort of seeing below the aorta with the act segment. And what we had was we just took the brakes off the scanner and we just manually, one of us in the scanner, moved the patient into the magnet and we followed the contrast down the legs. So we kind of call this non-moving table contrast enhanced MRA for peripherals. But this was solved. And this is a paper from Jim Meany and Sasha, uh, who I haven't seen. Is Sasha here yet? Yes, yes, she's over there. Um, this is her cartoons for moving bed imaging, so we can uh, not have to put the patient through manually. We can put them through automatically and follow the contrast down the legs. We often forget, though, that back at this time, all our sequences were standard contrast uh, encoded in that the case space was actually at the center of the acquisition. So timing was actually quite a problem for us. And we had to work out from timing boluses how long it was going to take for contrast to arrive. This was revolutionized when we moved the acquisition of our central case space lines to the beginning of the sequence because then our contrast arrival time was the, the delay time to starting our sequence. Though we soon learned that we needed to recess the actual KY, K0 right into the, the into the not the right at the very beginning but a few seconds from the beginning so that we had a more robust uh, acquisition without any ringing artifacts. This was the first SMRA or as it was then the MR Angio Club uh, meeting I went to in Lyon in uh, 2000, which was organized by, by Philippe Dueck. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but he'd organized a parallel meeting on coronary imaging at that time, um, and it was on coronary MRA and coronary CTA, and I maybe should have paid more attention to that, I suppose, at the time. The next part of the history of CE MRA is phased array coils, which allowed us to get a much higher SNR so we could get higher spatial resolution for seeing smaller arteries. 
Uh, we could acquire that more rapidly. We could do breath hold scans, for example, for the abdomen, for the renal arteries. And obviously, parallel imaging is uh, um, completely based on the use of phased array coils. This is, I think, the first time resolved breath hold 3D contrast enhanced MRA. And this is myself holding my breath during infusion of uh, 30 mils of Omniscan gadolinium contrast agent. So that was published around the turn of the century. So parallel imaging, it can be used for increasing our spatial resolution in the same scan time, or we can have the same resolution in a shorter scan time, um, or we can do combinations of these or increase our field of view. And there are various different methods for this. So, you know, we have the 4D track from Philips, we have tr tricks from GE and Twist from Siemens. But effectively, it allows us to get a many, many bites at the cherry as the contrast goes through the, the region of interest that we want to see. So we get dynamic imaging, such as this patient's forearm and hand. The last speaker mentioned 3 Tesla. 3 Tesla certainly gives us uh, more SNR compared to 1.5T, maybe not as quite as much as we would have hoped, but it does give us more SNR. So again, this allows us to get higher spatial resolution, better defined smaller arteries, etc. Uh, and there's also the potential here for lower contrast agent dose for the same, the same image quality. M. Dixon imaging has been introduced for contrast enhanced MRA. Um, this is a paper from Tim Liner. Uh, this is some e examples from my own practice. Um, not particularly much disease in this particular patient, but just to show that you've got intrinsic fat saturation. So we don't need that acquisition of the non-contrast volume to subtract from our contrast volume. Uh, we can go straight to acquiring the contrast enhanced study. The next part of the history of contrast enhanced MRA was the introduction of blood pool contrast agents with the commercialization of gadophosphoset. Uh, so this is an agent that stays in the blood pool for longer with no leak into the interstitium. Um, so for first pass MRA and for dynamic MRA, this is exactly the same as normal gadolinium-based contrast agents. But the advantage was the extended phase imaging where we've got the contrast agent in the blood, in the arteries and in the veins in equal concentration for hours on end. So we can, we can image at very high spatial resolution. Um, and it really opened up the... the, the uh, field of imaging the veins for me and actually seeing the detail in the veins. Unfortunately, the commercialization uh, of this failed. Uh, the company didn't take enough mon make enough money and it was taken off the market, uh, so it was no longer available. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame, but gadophosphoset is now uh, not available for commercial use. However, it did highlight to me that we could actually acquire higher spatial resolution if we just run things uh, right together. So this is my standard normal gadolinium-based contrast uh, protocol for lower limb uh, MRA. So we do a, a, a dynamic of the lower limb arteries below the knees with one injection. And we then go on to a standard bolus chase of the uh, aortoiliac femoral popliteal and below knee arteries. But then we immediately start imaging at high spatial resolution because we've still got gadolinium contrast on board and it's equ roughly equal in the arteries and veins and we can get very similar images to the blood pool contrast agents and it allows us to show the veins as well as the arteries for the surgeons. And ferromoxitol, ferromoxitol can do the same. This is an iron-based USPIO that, that, that stays intravascular. Uh, we use this in patients with advanced renal failure in whom uh, our renal physicians don't want us to use gadolinium-based contrast agents. Um, we've done quite a bit of work with this and we finally have uh, a clinical program where we can uh, image uh, suitable patients with this, particularly for venous imaging, particularly for patients where we're planning renal transplant because the surgeons want to see both the arteries and the veins in these patients. They don't just want the arterial side of the information. So we have contrast-enhanced MRA. It is now a robust uh, uh, technology. It's a mature technology, and we can image all body areas, and we can image in first pass, and we can image dynamically. So it looks like it's a fantastic tool. But what is its current status? It faces many challenges, um, not least from CT angiography, as the previous speaker alluded to, but also from these other things, such as CIEDs, which I'll explain to you, guidelines, uh, contrast issues still rear their head, and there's also the changing pattern of investigation and expectation within health services. So going back to Philippe and the, the meeting in Lyon when he was talking about CT angio for the coronary arteries, it's CT of the coronary arteries that has actually dramatically changed uh, the world of CT in terms of dose and acquisition speed. So how do we choose between contrast-enhanced MRA and CT angiography? 
Do we choose the one that's most accurate, the one that's most intellectually stimulating to us, or the easiest to do, or the cheapest, or the safest? Which one do we do for our patients? The answer is that we do the examination that is most appropriate for the patient that we have in front of us. I'm going to touch on different safety aspects. Radiation, in this meeting, we've on the over the years, we've always gone on about how radiation is a prime advantage of MRA over CTA. I'm going to talk a little bit about the device issues and a little bit about contrast. So I want you to make, make you aware that CT radiation doses have come down dramatically over the last decades, okay? Uh, this has been particularly driven by the uh, technology behind CT for, co for coronary arteriography. Uh, this is an example given to me by a colleague of a patient that he happened to image with different uh, CT systems from the same manufacturer but uh, seven years apart. And there's a huge 38-fold dose reduction in CT compared with when that patient was first imaged with exactly the same image quality. And this has only got more dramatic now that the we have even further advancements with both AI uh, iterative reconstruction algorithms and AI applied to that, but also silver beam uh, filtration for the, the CT beam. So the doses of CT have really come way, way down. And we can, I think, really not cite radiation as a, as a, as a great uh, reason for uh, wanting to use MRA over CTA. We have to have other reasons for wanting to use contrast enhanced MRA. The other thing I'd like to point out is that the patient population we image is changing. Many more of them have these devices fitted in them. We used to be very afraid of these devices in our patients. They're not so dangerous nowadays. Um, we can image patients that have got uh, conditional devices implanted, but the number of these patients is increasing dramatically over the years. And the number of these patients with these devices that need imaging uh, and the amount of imaging they need is also in increasing dramatically. And sometimes these systems aren't simple. And this is a patient who's got legacy devices, legacy leads, so, so they're off-label. They're not necessarily fully conditional uh, anymore. This is an advoc advocacy group in the UK, MRI My Pacemaker, which is trying to make sure that patients with pacemaker devices and uh, implanted defibrillators get as much access to MRI as the rest of us. Uh, and that's their mission. Um, it's very laudable. Uh, but it has to be said that in the real world of guidelines, this is guidelines from the Heart Rhythm Society, uh, this is talking about patients who need MRI, it's where MRI is reasonable. Uh, and with CTA advanced so much, then often most of the vascular questions we are asked about these patients can be answered by CTA and do not need to be answered by MRI. So the word reasonable. That word reasonable also comes into as low as reasonably achievable for radiation reduction. The other thing I want to touch on is guidelines. This is, uh, this is NICE guidelines in the UK for uh, suspected pulmonary embolism. Um, and this is obviously aimed at clinicians. They want to know when should I suspect pulmonary embolism. Okay, so there are many, many things that pulmonary embolism can be mimicked by. Um, and there are, these are all within the differential diagnosis. Uh, that the clinician wants to know that it, if it's not pulmonary embolism, is it one of these many, many other things? And we wouldn't advocate using MRI for diagnosing pneumothorax or pneumonia or something like that. There are many, many things that mimic it and many things that we want to, to rule out from that diagnosis. And these guidelines also tell us how to image our patients in terms of when we should image our patients. So patients should be immediately admitted if they have suspected pulmonary embolism to hospital. Okay, so that's the word immediate there. Um, and for people who have a high pretest probability, they should get immediate computed tomography. Okay, so it doesn't mention anything about MRI, it talks about CT. And if the test is positive, uh, then they should have other in immediate investigations. So the, the guidelines don't just talk about which imaging test to do, but also when to do it. So here's a patient with suspected pulmonary embolism. It's a young patient, low pretest probability, low dose CT pulmonary angiogra angiography. For those radiologists, those who are not radiologists in the audience, there was a pulmonary embolism there, but it's a very subtle pulmonary embolism, okay? It's only a subsegmental clot. I know that I would not be able to diagnose that even with the best pulmonary MRA, I don't think that I could lay my hands on. So I'm completely comfortable with using CT pulmonary angiography for these kinds of patients. I know that pulmonary MRA is not going to work. And the guidelines are also based on things like the evidence such as PIAP-HED3, which shows that pulmonary MRA 
has a very poor reproducibility in, in many centers. And it's the same for coronary. These are the guidelines for coronary uh, imaging, non-invasive coronary imaging. They all tell us since 2016, right up to the most recent guidelines, uh, AHA in 2021, to use CT. They do not mention coronary MRA. And that's because coronary CT can now be acquired in one breath hold, okay? So we can acquire coronary CT in a single breath hold at very low dose, okay? Single breath hold, single heartbeat in very low dose. Okay, and we can get beautiful images that show the coronary arteries and we can color them any way we want. But we also have very high spatial resolution. Spatial resolution that MRA at the moment cannot hope to compete with. Uh, spatial resolution that is only improving as we move to photon counting systems and we can see inside very, very small stents. These stents are only two millimeters uh, in diameter. So coronary MRA is not going to challenge CT anytime soon in my opinion. And this goes back to work I've done looking at our local uh, use of imaging over the years. So CT pulmonary angiography in the last decade has increased exponentially, particularly over the COVID pandemic period. Around Glasgow, we now currently image 1% of our adult population per year with CT pulmonary angiography for one reason or another. And coronary CT is also increasing uh, significantly. Moving on to contrast agents, contrast media. So. The commonest adverse event in radiology is in fact contrast media extravasation for CT scanning, uh, which can be severe and can be a problem. It's not a problem for MR, so that's an advantage for MR. Even if we do extravasate our contrast, it's very small volumes and no one's ever had any serious sequelae from that. But hypersensitivity reactions are also lower with contrast for MR. I'm gonna have to move on quickly because MR does have an issue that CT doesn't with both NSF, NSF is ne nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, um, really only occurred in those patients on dialysis. It's really extremely low risk or probably no risk for using macrocyclic agents, but the legacy of the NSF uh, problems that we had in years gone past still taints the way we use uh, gadolinium-based contrast agents. And the work by Kanda from uh, this country on the aspects of gadolinium retention, which teaches that all gadolinium agents, no matter what type, are retained to some degree in the body, has also made us more cautious about using large doses of contrast or multiple and repeat doses of gadolinium-based contrast agents. So there is still some challenge there. Similar to what I was talking about with uh, CT of the chest, carotid studies, this is looking at our carotid studies over the last decades. Um, you'd think that we would be using more and more contrast to MRA for carotids, but we're not. We're, we're going down, and CT is really taking over uh, the imaging of the carotid arteries. Even though we can use vessel wall imaging, um, people don't seem to be that actually that interested in using it clinically. And that's because we've, again, changing the way we image patients with suspected stroke. Here's a patient with suspected stroke. Um, this is a plain CT scan done in the emergency department immediately on arrival. These are read by artificial intelligence algorithms which show that the early ischemic changes are there. The artificial intelligence algorithms, these, these are commercial, this is what I'm using every day, will pick up the dense vessel sign, okay? It shows us the, the thrombus in the MCA. And we go straight on to doing CT perfusion and also CT angiography. And when we image patients in the emergency department with carotid CTA, we see things that really we didn't see so much in the past when we didn't image them so emergently. So just to magnify that up, here is the carotid. It's not only stenose, but there's this luminal filling defect here, okay? So this CT is not only showing us the lipid-rich plaque, but it's showing what I would call a smoking gun of the thrombus still in the artery there that caused the stroke, okay? So that tells us not just that the patient has a tight stenosis, but we know that that plaque has actually caused that stroke. We know that that's the problem. It's not just that that's bystander stenotic disease. And the surgeons are also interested in things on the CT that you might not think of, such as the styloid process here, as that whether that's high or not in relation to the bifurcation for their surgery. Patients with TIA, on the other hand, where the, the, they present and the neurology has resolved, that are going to need MRI for making the diagnosis of this tiny little thalamic infarct you would never ever see on CT. Those patients, I, you know, we do use MR as the first investigation, and therefore, at that point, we would use MRA as the first investigation of their carotids. Here's another similar patient. Just These are patients just in the last couple of weeks. Um, another patient with a TIA. They've come to the clinic as an outpatient. 
we do the contrast enhanced MRA and we show the type carotid stenosis. The surgeons don't want to know what kind of plaque this is. They don't want vessel wall imaging. They're happy to operate on the basis of this alone. You will have to speak up a little bit. Okay. So contrast enhanced MRA uh, versus the aorta. The aorta we're imaging differently these days. Patients have uh, much more metal in their aorta. So this is a patient with, a, uh, with an endo leak after an endovascular aneurysm repair. Again, we don't image these patients with CTA, uh, so with MRA, because CT is our workhorse for, uh, workhorse for aortic imaging, both for planning and for post-operative surveillance. And that shows, again, although in Glasgow we do a lot of contrast-enhanced MRA for the lower limbs compared to many other UK centres, um, the, the rate we do it is dropping and we're using increasing amounts of CTA. Here's a patient with osteomyelitis of the foot. We use MRI for looking at the foot, so why would we not use MRA for looking at the blood vessels? Well, we're getting many, many more of these kind of patients in our practice that just do not fit in our magnets. They d we can't put our phased array coils onto the belly to actually image them. So we had to take them out of the magnet. We couldn't do an MRA. We had to go to CT. Similarly, this patient, uh, we couldn't do MRA on this patient. His, m his leg doesn't bend. He doesn't fit in a magnet. He doesn't fit into coil systems that we have. Sometimes we do CTA and it doesn't work. Sometimes we outrun the contrast folos or we don't know what's going on and then we go to MRA and we can show what's needed. Here's a patient with critical lower limb ischemia. We can document the critical lower limb ischemia, the occlusions with anything, with CT, with duplex ultrasound, but MRA with contrast allows us to look at the veins at the same time and tells the, the surgeon that they've got a good vein there that they can use as a bypass conduit to save this patient's residual leg. Similarly, this young patient without prior history of uh, peripheral vascular disease has got an acutely ischemic left leg, which we can show on the dynamic MRA, but again, with an, a, a comprehensive protocol that looks at the veins, we can show that the deep veins in this left leg have got deep venous thrombosis, and this deep venous thrombosis extends from the popliteal up to the superficial femoral vein, right up to the common femoral vein at the groin. So clearly this patient has had paradoxical embolism as the cause for critical lower limb ischemia. The next paradoxical embolism could go to the brain, could go to the gut, could kill them. But we only make the diagnosis by using MRA and looking at the arteries and the veins and looking at both of these things. This is another area where I think you MRA will be I useful. speak up the, you were all the time. Okay, it's, this is the last bit, is that we're looking at things in the, in the uh, like arteriovenous malformations, where again, CT will not tell us everything we need to do. There are new contrast agents on the way, new macrocyclic agents with increased relaxivity, um, which I will skip over that. And just in summary to say that it is a mature technology, but it faces many, many challenges. Uh, acute situations tend to favor CT. Guidelines are pushing us towards CT for many things. Um, we need to get our society to put, a, put in place guidelines for where, where MRI and MRA are appropriate, and these tend to be more niche things. And particularly, I would say that we need to look, concentrate more on venous imaging. Sorry, I ran over. <laughs> I had a lot to put in. Thank you. Yeah, there will be a panel discussion at the end, so in consideration of time, we will invite the... Uh, Next speaker, could you also uh, display the next uh, talk?